When I was thinking of applying to the Rice Graduate History Program, I met with Alan Mattiso, who was then Dean of Humanities. He'd been a mentor of mine when I was an undergraduate at Rice, and when I approached him about writing a recommendation, he wanted to meet. After about an hour, having decided my heart was pure and my intentions honorable, he agreed to write a reference. And once that was settled, he sat thoughtfully for a moment. You should work with John Bowles, he said. John likes graduate students. <laughs> Setting aside for a moment what that implied about other Rice faculty, <laughs> I took his advice to heart, met with John about my graduate plans, and he agreed to be my advisor. I never worked at the journal as a graduate student, but I was hired as assistant editor. When the position came open, I received a phone call from Evelyn Nolan. Did I know they were looking for an assistant editor? Well, yes, I'd heard that, but shouldn't I talk with John if I had thought of applying? He told me to call you, she said. <laughs> well, I can take a hint, so I interviewed with John and Evelyn, and I think Pat probably got a vote as well and was hired on. As you've heard, a lot goes on at the journal. You're immersed in the newest and best Southern history scholarship. It's like trying to drink from an intellectual fire hose most days. Unquestionably, working for the journal makes you a better historian. But, as John would say, I want to complexify the place. The most valuable education to be gained was often subtle and implicit. How the office operated said everything about John as an advisor and teacher. He gave us, staff and students, a front row seat in the community of professional historians. We learned a lot that went beyond topic knowledge. For example, no one's writing is perfect the first time around. No one. Good historical writing is a process of research, drafting, editing, revision, more editing, and more revision, helped along by generous scholars anxious to present the best possible work. Readers' reports are generally insightful and supportive. Occasionally, they are petty and cruel. We didn't send those on. Everyone can have a bad day. Even the most illustrious star in the historical heavens may misspell names and get page numbers wrong. We are all human, and the journal really does check all those citations. Some historians return books if they feel they would have to write a bad review. Courage may be demonstrated in small and unusual places. And we learned a lot about the mechanics of writing. I suspect any of us, given a few moments, can format a footnote or a bibliographical reference on demand. But more than anything, the journal was a safe space. While we were intensely engaged in the practical aspects of historical scholarship, we were also a very humane place, an island in what can be an extremely stressful environment, especially when you're a grad student. Pat Burgess always welcomed you with a smile. Evelyn Nolan was available for critical advice on wardrobe, etiquette, and other deportment issues. And I tried to be sympathetic. For much of my tenure at the journal, I was ABD, and I could commiserate about courses, workloads, due dates, exams, and when I finally finished, I was living proof that dissertation completion was possible. We saw history and historians at all their stages, from student conversations about possible paper topics, draft dissertation chapters, manuscripts submitted by new and old longtime scholars, and books hot off the presses arrived every day. There was a great comfort in learning the process and the ritual of our discipline. Recently, John told me that a colleague mentioned that whenever you see one of John's students, current or former, there tend to be other Rice grads around. The colleague marveled somewhat that we really seem to like each other. <laughs> we do. There's no mystery. Throughout our graduate careers, we had modeled for us a community of scholarship that was collaborative, supportive, and positive. History was not a zero-sum game. Our success did not come at another's expense. There, were good work, there was good work to be done in myriad areas, intellectual glory for all, and at critical moments, an advisor to keep you on track. An environment like the journal doesn't happen by accident. And we laughed a lot. I wish I could tell you what about, but I honestly can't remember. The great eternal barbecue debate, the finer points of chicken fried steak, Texas politics, a lot about Texas politics. I have never worked in a place with as many smart, funny people. When I finally got around to a dissertation proposal, I went to John with a scheme for not only a written dissertation, but an accompanying museum exhibit that would travel to three cities. I gave him my best spiel and waited. Well, he said, I've never directed anything like that, but if that's okay with you, it's okay with me. 
Not for the first or last time, John demonstrated his willingness to explore new ways of doing Southern history. One of the things I most admire about him. His commitment to the integrity of the profession while being open to new ways that it might be practiced shaped the journal for 30 years. He will be a tough act to follow, but I know Randall and Bethany, like all of John's students, have been trained by the best. And at this point, I'd like to ask all of John's students in the audience, current and former, to please stand. Thank you, John. <laughs> 